Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Ard Lamont Mystery, the real-life story behind the creation of Sherlock Holmes by Daniel Smith. This is non-fiction, and as usual I'm going to read the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then share some thoughts and feelings and an overall rating at the end. So, in 1893, young army officer Cecil Hambra was murdered, unleashing one of the most gripping court cases Victorian Britain had ever known. Even more remarkably, the case brought together two pioneering forensic experts, two men upon whom Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes happened to be based. Their involvement in the Ardlemont mystery reveals how the world's most famous detective came to be. So, let's take a look at what we got. So right at the beginning we have a mention of The White Company, which is an Arthur Conan Doyle novel which I have over there on my uh, To Be Read pile, which I will hopefully get to soon. So I thought this was amusing, this is um, uh, some information on Bell here, and uh, it says Another of his party tricks was to pass a test tube of amber coloured liquid among his class. It was, he informed them, a powerful drug with an extremely bitter taste, and in order to assess each student's powers of observation, he wished them to sample it one by one. But, he told them, being a fair man, he would not demand of them that which he wouldn't do himself. He promptly dipped a finger in the potion, put his finger in his mouth and pulled an appropriately pained face. Every member of the group then followed suit so that the room was soon filled with faces set in an array of contortions. Gentlemen, gentlemen, he said. I'm deeply grieved to find that not one of you had developed the power of perception, the faculty of observation which I speak so much of, for if you had truly observed me, you would have seen that while I placed my index finger in the awful brew, it was the middle finger, I, which somehow found its way into my mouth. So it says, given Doyle's own family background, his father was an illustrator whose career was blighted by alcohol abuse and psychological problems, money was an important consideration for him. When he submitted a tax return in 1883 showing that he had earned insufficient money to make him liable for tax, the tax office returned it emblazoned with the comment, most unsatisfactory. Doyle resubmitted it with his own additional observation. I quite agree. Um, Doyle as well, he called his readers constant readers, which is what Stephen King does too. So uh, we've got here, notes of Little John's lectures on medical jurisprudence, which is the practice of using medicine to figure out, a, you know, the solution to a crime. Uh, emphasised the clear-sighted approach that he brought to his subject. He taught, for instance, a simple checklist that the forensic examiner should keep in mind when attempting to establish whether a death is the result of accident, suicide or murder. The investigator, he said, should consider 1. The position of the body 2. The nature of the injuries 3. The direction of the wound 4. The position of the instrument 5. The marks of blood 6. The evidence of a struggle We have some stuff here about Robert Peel as well. He's actually from Tamworth, which is the town that I'm from. Robert Peel famously oversaw the establishment of the Metropolitan Police in London in 1829, really a successor to the smaller scale Bow Street Runners who had been operating since the middle of the previous century. But again Scotland had been ahead of the game. Back in 1800 the city of Glasgow Police was established, becoming the first publicly founded professional police force in the world. And so this is like their early attempts at kind of forensics I guess, they're doing some testing so um says here, the dog skins, meanwhile, were used to study the different effects of various gunpowders upon the epidermis. First, a black skin was hung on a board that was fired at from about six inches. In the case of the amberite powder, the shot cut through the hairs on the skin, but there was no evidence of scorching. However, aware that the black skin might disguise any subtle discoloration, the experiment was repeated using a white skin. Speedy then went a step further, buying a quantity of human hair to see if it would show signs of singeing from shots fired from a short distance. After discharging his weapon at point-blank range, he next decided to involve his wife in his investigations. The poor woman, accommodating to a fault, let down her hair and allowed her husband to fire a full cartridge of amberite powder through her tresses from a distance of two feet. The powder neither singed the hair nor even left the smell, presumably much to his wife's general relief. And uh, this is another one of the characters involved in the, in the investigation. At the beginning of September, it was decided by the local police to seek the assistance of Scotland Yard. Inspector Thomas Greet was put in charge of the investigation in London, where he was assisted by Sergeant Thomas Brockwell. Greet would rise to greater public prominence a couple of years later when, in 1895, he arrested the Marquess of Queensbury in relation to the libelling of Oscar Wilde. With Wilde having taken the aristocrat's son, Alfred Lord Douglas, as his lover, the Marquess left a calling card for Wilde at the Albemarle Club in London in which he notoriously described him as posing as a somdomite. That's deliberate, by the way. Greet was called upon to give evidence to the Old Bailey about the arrest of Queensbury at Carter's Hotel on Albemarle Street, so binding the policeman into the story of the sorry demise of Oscar Wilde. And uh, this happened here. This is interesting because a similar thing happened after Kurt Cobain's suicide. A couple of people accidentally shot themselves. From the southernmost tip of Cecil's native Isle of Wight to the most northerly point of Scotland, there could scarcely have been anyone in the late 1893 who did not have a theory as to what had happened in the woods at Ardlemont. For some, the fascination would prove lethal. 
Take, for example, the curious case of Henry Card, who lost his life in early September while out walking with his local pub landlord near Lymington in the New Forest. He had, it seemed, been attempting to prove how Cecil's injuries might have been self-inflicted. Taking a gun, he placed it behind his back with one hand and then pulled the trigger with his other. The weapon happened to be loaded and the unfortunate card blew off the top of his skull by this demonstration. He left a widow and nine children, yet more victims of the Ardlemont tragedy. Uh, like a lot of books as well, it's got some uh, images inside, which are quite cool because a lot of these are photos from 1896 and stuff, you know. I thought this was an interesting insight. Across the newspapers, homosexuality was characterised as a vice of the upper classes, while the young men who worked as prostitutes were depicted as innocents corrupted by men who ought to have known better. I thought this was cool. As a famous judge of the time, Lord Young would later put it, there are four classes of witnesses. Liars, damned liars, expert witnesses, and Sir Henry Littlejohn. And there's this guy called Heron Watson, and it says, While Bell was considered an extremely dexterous surgeon, Heron Watson had a reputation for being even quicker. It was said he could complete an amputation at the hip in under 10 seconds. That is some speedy hip amputation. I thought this was interesting as well. In, this is when we were at, uh, at, at trial. Comrie Thompson then adopted a risky tactic. He referred to the fact that Monson had taken his son with him when he showed Dr. McMillan the scene of the shooting just a few hours after it had occurred. Can you conceive, the defence counsel pondered, that if that man had within recent hours been guilty of murdering his friend who had been living with him and had been attached to him for years past, he would take probably the purest and the simplest being within his reach to show him the place at which that horrible crime had been committed by his own father. We know that there is almost no limit to the depths of human depravity, but the notion that a murderer, when his hand was still red with the blood of the victim, would take his little boy by the hand to show him the spot where he had committed the crime is, I think, absolutely incredible. It takes a brave lawyer to declare the charges laid against his client to be so monstrous as to be unbelievable. But that was just what Comrie Thompson urged the jury to conclude. They might, though, have decided that the allegation was actually proof of Monson's monstrousness. I thought this was interesting as well. The public, meanwhile, were champing at the bit. It was indicative of the clamour surrounding the trial that on average over 150,000 words of newspaper coverage were sent by telegraph from Edinburgh's general post office on each day of the proceedings. Bookmakers even offered odds on the verdict. In the last few days of the trial, you could get 9-4 to four on an acquittal. And then he was found guilty of not proven, which is a specific thing in Scottish law. This was strange as well, just... The fate of Monson became an ongoing subject of debate in both private and public forums. During the trial, for example, a miner called Alexander Mayer got on a train at Glasgow Central Station with his wife and struck up a conversation with two men in his compartment as to the probable fate of the defendant. Before long, there was an altercation which developed into a fight, during which Mayer was stabbed in the forehead. Fortunately, he survived. Stabbed in the forehead? Uh, they said as well, accidental deaths involving shotguns are far more common than homicides. And this is a very strange way to die here as well, it says, For the head of Monson's defence team, John Comrie Thompson, the Ardlement case proved the last great criminal trial of his life. He died suddenly in August 1898, having slipped and fallen on deck while on a cruise. So overall, I thought this was fascinating. It's, um, you know, true crime, but there's also this time of Sherlock Holmes. So if you either like true crime or you like Sherlock Holmes, you're probably going to enjoy it. I whizzed through it in a couple of days. Just, yeah, I thought it was very enjoyable. I gave it 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I thought of the Ardlement Mystery, the real life story behind the creation of Sherlock Holmes by Daniel Smith. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.